हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टनिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कैट गेस वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टनिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts updates and recent exams. Part 1. Here a conversation between two flatmates, Craig and Don, who are looking for a third person to share their flat. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hi Craig, been home long? Yeah, quite a time. Did anyone phone about renting the spare room? Yeah, we've had 3 phone calls about it. Really? Yeah. Do you want to hear about them? Sure. Right. The first one was called Phil Parrot. Uh-huh. He's a teacher. He's just qualified and he teaches sports. Okay. Actually, I'm not sure about him. He certainly sounded energetic, but He asked lots of questions about whether we smoked and what sort of food we cooked. Yeah. I mean we don't exactly live on pizza and chips and takeaways. Well, not quite, but but he might be a bit too health conscious to really fit in with the sort of life we lead. Yeah. And he asked a lot of questions about the room. He said he needs a big room because he's got lots of sports equipment. Well, th that's okay. The room's quite big, but I'm not so sure about him. What about the second one? He was called David Spencer. Spender? No, Spencer. C E R. He works at Cooper Long. You know, the big company on Broad Street. He said he was a lawyer. Oh. I'd have thought in that case he'd be earning enough to rent his own place. I wonder why he wants to share a flat. Well, he didn't say. He's quite a bit older than us. He did say he's just moved down here from the north of England. He seemed very quiet actually. Maybe he wants to meet some new people. I got the impression he was a hard-working kind of person who doesn't go out all that much. Right. But he sounded okay. Oh, one thing though, he said he wouldn't be staying in the flat at the weekends, so he wants to pay reduced costs for gas and electricity. because he's only here 5 days out of 7. Oh, I'm not sure about that. What do you think? Well, I suppose it's fair, but it all sounds a bit complicated. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at question 6 to 10. Anyway, there was a third person, Leo Norris. Yes. He's an engineer. Oh yeah. And he's about our age. Right. What did he sound like? Well, actually he was really funny. I couldn't stop laughing when I was talking to him. He said he was very lazy and never got up until noon at weekends, and I said that wouldn't be a problem here. <laughs> no, certainly not. But actually I suspect he was joking when he said he was lazy. I think he lives life as it comes. He's certainly not competitive or stressed, but he likes cycling and things like that. He sounds like an outdoor type. Anyway, I thought he sounded as if he'd fit in. He wanted to check if there was somewhere safe for his bicycle. That's not a problem. No. He can leave it in the garage with my car. So did you get his contact details? Yes. He left his mobile number. It's 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 
O triple seven six eight seven two four double three. And does he want to move in straight away? Well, he's paid his rent in his present place up to the thirty first of September, but he said that if possible he'd like to move in a bit before then. He said the twenty eighth of September. And he was okay about the rent? Yeah. He said it was fine. Right. So shall we give him a ring and see if he wants to come round and That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You'll hear a talk between a host and a professor called Alison Downing about cocoa beans. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Hello and welcome to today's talk. Here with me is the famous botanist, Professor Alison Downing. So, Alison, tell us something about cocoa beans. Cocoa beans, also called cacao beans, are the primary constituent in making chocolate, grown in tropical areas in South and Central America, West Africa and Asia. The cocoa tree is often raised on small, family-owned farms. When the harvested pods are open to expose the beans, the pulp and cocoa seeds are removed and the rind is discarded. The pulp and seeds are then piled in heaps, placed in bins or laid out on grapes for several days. During this time, the seeds and pulp undergo a process called sweating, where the thick pulp liquefies as it ferments. The fermented pulp trickles away, leaving cocoa seeds behind to be collected. This is when the beans are harvested and then the bags holding them are ready to be transported. But the most important step in processing the cocoa bean is cleaning it. Once the beans are unloaded from the railroad cars, the packages are opened and then weighed by machines. Then the pods are split and the seeds or beans are covered with a sweet white pulp or mucilage. On arrival at the factory, the cocoa beans are sorted and put in a hopper to be cleaned more rigorously. The wet beans are then transported to a facility so they can be fermented and dried. They are fermented for four to seven days and must be mixed every two days. They are dried for five to fourteen days, depending on the climate conditions. The fermented beans are dried by spreading them out over a large surface and constantly raking them. Then the beans are ready to be roasted. Now. Roasting takes place at a high temperature and then the beans are boiled in a heated chamber. During the roasting process, the beans will be expanded and cracked. But prior to this, the beans are trodden and shuffled about using bare human feet. During this process, red clay mixed with water is sprinkled over the beans to obtain a finer colour polish and protection against moulds during shipment to factories in the United States, the Netherlands, the United Kingdom and other countries. Now, back to what I was saying. After the beans are cracked, they need to be cooled. Then the roasted beans are sealed in pockets. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Wow, that is not a simple process, is it? But someone told me that different roasting levels of coffee can lead to different kinds of flavours. Yes, roasting coffee transforms the chemical and physical properties of green coffee beans into roasted coffee products. The roasting process is what produces the characteristic flavour of coffee by causing the green coffee beans to change in taste. Unroasted beans contain similar, if not higher, levels of acids, protein, sugars and caffeine as those that have been roasted but lack the taste of roasted coffee beans due to the Maillard and other chemical reactions that occur during roasting. The vast majority of coffee is roasted commercially on a large scale, but small-scale commercial roasting has grown significantly with the trend toward single-origin coffees served at specialty shops. Some coffee drinkers even roast coffee at home as a hobby in order to both experiment with the flavour profile of the beans and ensure the freshest possible roast. So here I'm going to introduce some of these roasted coffee beans and their special flavours. Now, the first crack is lighter bodied and has a higher acidity level with no obvious roast flavour and is popular for its special mild taste. This level of roast is ideal for tasting the full original character of the coffee. The green beans are raw, unroasted coffee beans. They are strictly hard beans with a smoky flavour and are slightly acidic. We've also got French roast and the flavour that comes across in French roast coffee usually has more to do with the roasting process than the actual quality of the beans. By the time the beans are dark enough to qualify as French, most of their original flavour has dissipated. In its place come the flavours of caramelising sugar, bittersweet coffee and often a bit of chocolate. And finally, espresso smoky. That is, coffee brewed by forcing a small amount of nearly boiling water under pressure through finely ground coffee beans. Espresso is generally thicker than coffee brewed through other methods, has a higher concentration of suspended and dissolved solids, and has creamer on top. As a result of the pressurised brewing process, the flavours and chemicals in a typical cup of espresso are very concentrated. Espresso is also the base for other drinks, such as café latte, cappuccino, café macchiato, café mocha, flat white or café americano. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear two medical students, Caitlin and Hideki, discussing options for courses. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 21 to 23. Hi, Hideki. How are you? Fine. I'm glad I bumped into you. Have you got five minutes to sit down and discuss our extra course options for next term? Yes, yeah, sure. You mean the support courses for our modules? Yes. We've got three choices, and I'm not sure which would be best for us to do. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, we could do science and ethics. Sounds quite interesting. Yes, but I think we should be thinking what we get out of each course. Mm. So, science and ethics, there's a lot of reading and research to do. And I don't think it comes up in the exams, does it? Um, I'm not sure. 
Uh, oh, I see we have to do assignments and we get our score from that. But what it would do is to force us to get better at doing essays and reports, you know, organizing them and using the right kind of language. Mm. Might be worthwhile. Yeah, you're right. An alternative is the pharmacology prelim course. Oh. I think it's in case we want to go on to transfer to pharmacology at the end of the year, because lots of students do. Mm -hmm. So it depends what we want to do in the future. But apparently, they send you off to find out about various companies and the differences between their products. It would give you lots of practice in investigative studies and analysis. I think I'd quite enjoy that. Yes, I see your point. Um, then the other option is reporting test results. Sounds a bit boring. Not sure why they have a separate course just for that. Well, I could certainly do with some help in that. Because if you go out into industry, that's what you'll spend most of your time doing. Mm. So it's got a very practical application. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to go for pharmacology. Me too. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 24 to 30. So, let's have a look at it in more detail. Oh, goodness. If we do pharmacology, then we have to do a supplementary maths course. Oh, no, that's not fair. Mm. Mind you, I think I need it. <laughs> Does that mean we have twice as many lectures? No. This maths is only a short course. The chemistry department are responsible, and they do it in the third term. So, we've got all next term to settle into the pharmacology bit. Oh, I find the tutor makes a real difference. Some of them make chemistry so easy, and some of them I can't understand at all. Like that one we had from Oxford University. Oh. <laughs> Mind you, the one on this course should make sense, because he's a lecturer who's coming in for a few weeks from industry. So, at least it'll be linked to the real world. <laughs> yeah. The project we have to do on this pharmacology course is huge, and it doesn't give us much time. We have to make a decision about what we want to do on the project as soon as we start in January, and then hand in our plans before the end of the month. Doesn't give us much time to sort out what's possible or not. Mm. I mean, doesn't the scale of our project depend on what resources we can have? Like, what equipment we can use? I suppose so, though I think there's plenty available. For example, it says that if we need to do any experiments, then we can use all the equipment in the new lab, as long as we book it. Oh, OK. It's slowly beginning to take shape for me. I think it'll be a good course. I'm just worried that I get enough support to do it. Oh, I think you'll be OK. And the tutors are always available if you get stuck. Oh, actually, it says that if you're not sure, then in December, they'll be running one or two additional seminars. So I might go to those. Actually, what's quite interesting is that at the end of the course, when our project is completed, then we have to do a presentation on it. Oh. I think that's quite good practice. Oh, a bit scary, though. <laughs> well... It shouldn't be too bad, as they say that we can do it in pairs. Oh. Spread the load, as it were. <laughs> oh, good. I have done presentations before, but I'm always very nervous. And is the presentation what we're assessed on, then? Let me look. Um... Ah, it says that we have an interview and we get a mark for the whole course, depending on how well we do in that. Oh, right. OK. So. I that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. You will hear a monologue on the subject of an amazing discovery. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome everybody. My name is Derek Fisher and I'll be taking you through this talk on a truly amazing discovery made by my team of researchers last year. As I'm sure you know, we discovered Tiktaalik rose, a so-called missing link in the evolutionary process, a fish that walked on land we made this extraordinary discovery in the Canadian Arctic. I should emphasize right at the beginning that I do not have any evidence to suggest that this was the only such fish to make the leap from the sea to the land. I think that further discoveries may await researchers. Anyway, the fossil discovery illuminates a chapter in the history of life on Earth that was essential to the ultimate emergence of human beings. This is an impression of Tiktaalik rose, which, we believe, lived about 375 million years ago. As you can see, it has features that blur the distinction between fish and terrestrial limbed creatures. The fossils that we found on Ellesmere Island, 600 miles from the North Pole, are a fine example of evolution in action. They have allowed us to freeze frame a process of adaption to land that took tens of millions of years, and which made possible the development of all the mammals, birds, reptiles and amphibians that have existed since. Without creatures such as Tiktaalik, there would have been no dinosaurs, no primitive mammals and none of the hominids such as Australopithecus africanus and Homo erectus that started the human family tree. This animal represents the transition from water to land, the part of history that includes ourselves. It's as much a part of our history as, say, Australopithecus africanus. Now you can see those teeth. From that, it is clear to us that Tiktaalik rose was a predator with sharp teeth and a head shaped like a crocodile's that grew to between four feet and nine feet. That's between 1.2 metres and 2.7 metres long, for those of you using the metric system. We named it after consultation with elders from the Inuit people, who are native to the region, who suggested their word for large shallow water fish. The second part of the name honours the person who funded our research, but wishes remain anonymous. It had several remarkable anatomical features that show it was capable not only of wading in shallow water, like slightly earlier fish on the cusp of the move to land, but also of supporting itself outside the water in the manner of four-limbed animals or tetrapods. This is where Tiktaalik truly blurs the boundary between fish and land animals. This animal is both fish and tetrapod. At first, we jokingly called it a fisherpod. Unlike fish, it had a clearly defined neck and a strong ribcage that would have enabled it to stand outside water. Its pectoral fins had a wrist joint which enabled it to crawl on the ground. This wrist is sufficiently similar to that of later animals, including human beings, to suggest that Tiktaalik or something very like it was an ancestor of all subsequent land animals. However, we cannot be sure of that. When we talk about the fish's wrist, we're talking about the origin of parts of our own wrist. It is absolutely clear from Tiktaalik's skeleton that it could support itself in shallow water or on land. This is why it represents a critical early phase in the evolution of all limbed animals, including humans. We found the Tiktaalik fossils in 2004 
after a five-year search of a rock formation on Ellesmere Island, one of the large islands that comprise the north of Canada. This site was chosen because it was, or more exactly the rocks were, laid down during the late Devonian period, between 380 million and 365 million years ago. When the transition of fish from sea creatures to creatures that could survive on land is known to have taken place. It may surprise you to know that although the rocks are now within the Arctic Circle, in the late Devonian they lay close to the equator. We, as individual humans, don't notice plate movements because dramatic changes can only be seen over millions of years. But the continents as we know them today have moved considerably and will continue to do so. This exciting discovery is providing a much deeper understanding of this evolutionary milestone. Previous fossils representing this evolutionary event have really been fish with a few land characteristics, or land vertebrates with a few residual fish characteristics. These fossils show an animal that sits bang in the middle. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I also update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking, you cut guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired dance score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com. The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.